to be the Holy Trinity, one God, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved. Amen. Look upon. 
Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Uh, we started our stewardship campaign with um, a song that may be familiar to some of you, the 23rd Psalm. Um, and today we're doing another one that I hope is familiar to you, um, and that I uh, I hope I hope it brings you hope. Um, it's a beautiful song, and I'm going to read it for us now, and um, just listen to it, and uh, I hope that it inspires you and uh, fills your hearts this morning. Lord, you have searched me out. O oh, Lord, you have known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O oh Lord, know it altogether. You encompass me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. Where can I go then from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I make the grave my bed, you are there also. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand will lead me, and your right hand hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me, and the light around me turn to night, darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you, because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful, and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. My days were fashioned before they came to be. How deep I find your thoughts, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. You that thirst for blood, depart from me. They speak despitefully against you. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate these, O oh Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. They have become my own enemies. Search me out, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my restless thoughts. Look well whether there be any wickedness in me, and lead me in the way that is everlasting. A reading from first. Thessalonians. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, 
who are left will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Then encourage one another with these words. The word of the Lord. Children of God, 
you are followers of the way, the truth, and the life. There are people sitting in this room this morning who are elated. And there are people sitting in this room this morning who are heartbroken and disappointed. There are people in this room who have lived in fear for the last four years. And there are people in this room right now who are afraid of what the next four years hold. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? It leaves us here, in this room, in this community, joining us online. It leaves us together. This is our world, our world. This is our country. This is our community. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's ours. We have different ideas about how things could or should work. But our different ideas do not change the fact that we are in this together. And for the good of our world, for the good of our country, for the good of our community, we must figure out a way to honor our differences. And if we're going to follow Christ, we are called to care for and love each other through it all. Every Sunday, we gather. Sometimes I wonder if you guys get sick of me talking about this. But you don't, because you show up every week. <laughs> so every Sunday, we gather. And we talk about the kingdom of God. I want to live there. But I can't live there without you. And you can't live there without me. We are in this together. You and me, members of our community, our elected and our appointed officials, Despite what you may have heard online or seen in memes or seen in the media, we are human beings. No matter how the powers that be try to divide us from each other into different tribes, different factions, Democrat and Republican, Christian and Muslim, black and white, we must always keep in mind that our commonalities far outweigh our differences. We're human. We're vulnerable. Maybe we like to pretend that we're not, but we are. And we're passionate. And we rejoice. And we hurt. And we love. This parable is challenging. It can be challenging in an easy week. But I think more than anything, this parable is an excellent illustration of our humanity and how God is with us. And God is calling us to be with each other, too. So here we are. We're talking about the kingdom again. And again, Jesus presents us with a story, an allegory. Ten bridesmaids are waiting for their bridegroom. Half are foolish, the text says, because they didn't bring enough oil for their lamps. The other half are wise because they did. And yet all the bridesmaids fall asleep while they're waiting. But when they wake up in the middle of the night and the news of the bridegroom is almost there, late, <coughs> might I add, the wise bridesmaids refuse to share their extra oil with the foolish bridesmaids. Instead, telling them, run off and buy your own. 
Well, they do that, and then they come back and nobody will let them in. The bridegroom refuses to acknowledge them. The kingdom of God is like this, Jesus says. So if you're like me, and you're reading this text, you're hearing this text, you're probably thinking to yourself, if this is the kingdom of God, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> Some exclusive party where you have to be totally prepared to get in. I think if this is the kingdom of God, most of us are in pretty big trouble. So, a word of caution then. You can read this parable as accusatory of the foolish bridesmaids. Like they did something wrong and therefore they deserve to be cast into the outer darkness. But if we're honest with ourselves, we'd be casting ourselves into the outer darkness then too. If we're honest with ourselves, at one time or another, we have all been the foolish bridesmaids. At one time or another, we have all been ill-prepared. At one time or another, we have all experienced questions and doubts. Our faith has been shaken. Pandemics, for example, not that any of us would have experience with that. <laughs> Health diagnoses, broken relationships, loss, tragedy, things within our control that break our hearts, and things well beyond our control that devastate us and leave us pounding on the door. Lord, Lord, open the door. But so, because we believe in a God of grace, which we do, because we have faith that God is drawing near to us, we're almost to Advent. And that nothing can or will separate us from the love of God, not sin, not our foolishness, or circumstances within or beyond our control. We know, I hope we know, that there is more to this parable than meets the eye. It would be a very easy sermon to preach if I said, Jesus wants you to stay awake. We'd all be very tired. Jesus wants you to stay awake, have your lamps lit, and be ready for action at any given point in time. And if you're not, you're a hell-bound sinner. <coughs> that would be an easy sermon. But that's not what's going on here. It's not. Because that's not the God that I know, and I'm confident that's not the God you know either. So, what's going on here then? So this is an apocalyptic text, a story about the return of Christ. It's been interpreted and much debated for the last 2,000 years or so, give or take, as a demand for you to be ready, you better have faith, be ready for Jesus to come back, and you better be prepared to do whatever it takes to save yourself, rather than trusting in God's infinite and unimaginable love. But we know different. We know as I said, that ours is a God of grace. And we know this because this is the creator that we experience each and every single day. This is the love that we know from Christ because we experience this love from friend and neighbor and in this community. This is why we're here today, why we're not sleeping in this morning, why we're not out to brunch. 
We are here today because this is the God that we experience, the God of grace and mercy and love. So I do not think this parable is about the return of Christ, at least not in the sense that when Christ returns, our lamps better be lit and we better have enough oil or else. No, I don't think this parable is about making us feel fear or stress or mortal peril. I actually, to some extent, take this parable at face value because I think it's about exactly what Jesus says it's about. The kingdom of God. It's about living together in community. Preparing. Preparing together for the inbreaking of God's kingdom. Preparing for Christ's reign among us by acting like Christ is already here with us. It's like that silly saying. Maybe you've seen it on bumper stickers. Jesus is coming, look busy. Anybody ever see it? Not so common in this area, but in other parts of the country, it's very, very popular. <laughs> Jesus is coming, look busy. What does that mean? Look busy. Love each other. Be together. Take care of each other. We know that we are in this together. It doesn't matter how much oil we have or don't have. If we fell asleep, like all the bridesmaids did, or if we stayed awake. If we've given up hope that the bridegroom, who is taking his sweet time, is ever going to come. Or if we're waiting by the door with our bags packed. We are in this together. And if I'm going to live in the kingdom, that means I need you to get there with me. My fortunes are bound up in your fortunes. My success is your success. And your success is mine. And so we're going to make it to this bridal party. If we're going to reach the kingdom, we ought to start acting like we, all of us, have been knit together by God, as the psalmist says, that each of us is fearfully and wonderfully made, that we're here to love each other and support each other and to be together for joy. When Matthew's Gospel of Catholic Church, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, Jerusalem and the temple had just been destroyed, and Jewish leaders were trying to regroup and stabilize their community. And they were doing this by cutting down rebellious and heretical strands of Judaism, of which the Jesus movement was one. They were drawing lines in the sand about who was in and who was out. This parable, when Matthew wrote it, it was really happening to real people like you and me. Real people were being cast out of their families, out of their homes, having their children ripped away from them, having their spouses ripped away from them, being told, you can't come back to the synagogue, you're not welcome here being told, you can't, you can't play with us anymore. You're not part of this community anymore. You're dead to us. So this is a story about real life, about religious leaders who literally shut the doors on the Jesus movement, about communities and families that were being ripped apart by ideas. Ideas an idea that God loves everyone, that God has saved everyone, that there's nothing we can do to save ourselves because the work has been done already for us. 
ideas that ultimately bred violence and despair and division. None of this, of course, will sound at all familiar to any of you. It's a good thing that we are far more evolved than our ancestors in the first century, that we would never quibble with each other over ideas. And none of you are laughing, and that was a joke. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> For smile, oh, thank you. You can appreciate that, Lynn, thank you. You can't see it. <laughs> you can't see it. Perfect, well done. Okay, so all joking aside, of course we have this experience. Of course, we know what it's like, individually and collectively. Of course, our families experience conflict. Our communities experience division. Of course, violence and frustration are not unique. You can open a history book, right, Carl? They're not unique to any one period in time, which is why this faith of ours is timeless. Our faith in God who takes on human flesh in the person of Jesus in order to proclaim that the kingdom of God has drawn near, that our sins are forgiven, that we are saved by the grace of God, not by ourselves, but by Jesus. <coughs> we don't have anything left to fight over. All that's left for us to do is to love each other. Jesus is changing everything. God's love is working wonders in us and in our world. But we must be willing to allow that change, those wonders, to enter into our broken hearts and our broken relationships and our broken communities and our broken world and to restore us and make us whole. We must know that when we send Pack the bridal party away because we have refused to share our oil. We do a disservice to the whole bridal party. When our neighbors are left out in the cold, they're not the only ones who suffer. We all suffer. So this isn't a parable that's telling you what you have to do in order to be saved. This is Jesus holding up a mirror to you, showing you who you are, you're wise and you're foolish. You are vulnerable, whether you want to admit it or not, and you're passionate, and you rejoice, and you hurt, and you love, and everything in between. This is Jesus calling you to embrace your humanity and to embrace the humanity of your neighbors. This is Jesus saying, I have saved you. I already love you. There's nothing you can do to change that. But please, love each other so that together, we can and will experience the kingdom of God. Amen.
and God pours love and grace into the world, and with God's help, we are about to do the same. Go now, good people, to roar, clap, and sing. Let's give everything we have together for joy. And go with the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Remember the four.